Dit is Papa Alfa 0 Echo Tango Echo voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate van vandaag, 30 januari 2016. Dit is het bulletin van zaterdag. Today's bulletin, as in every weekend, will be in English. We do have some Contestia 125-8 and auto-switching other data for you, which will be at the end of the show. Hello and welcome to the TX Talk podcast of the GB2 RS News from the Radio Society of Great Britain. Now the radio propagation report compiled by G0 Kilowatt Yankee Alpha, Golf 4 Bravo Alpha Oscar and Golf 3 Yankee Lima Alpha on Friday the 29th of January. Solar activity was a little more settled last week. The solar flux index was in the range 104 to 113 and the K index was mainly around 1 or 2 later in the week after reaching 4 on Sunday. This week the solar flux index is predicted to remain in the range 100 to 118 with lower activity on Friday the 5th and Saturday the 6th. The K index will be mostly settled but possibly reaching 4 on Tuesday or Wednesday. During the past week, the noon critical frequencies measured by the Chilton Ionosond reached 7.5 MHz on Wednesday, offering a maximum usable frequency over 3,000 km of about 27 MHz. 10 and 12 meters have shown some activity with Bob, Victor Papa, 8 Lima Papa on the Falkland Islands making an appearance at times. Staying with the South Atlantic, the Victor Papa 8 Sierra Golf India D Expedition should hopefully be on the air this week from South Georgia Island on 7 MHz and 14 MHz. The best times for working them will be on 40 meters after midnight and 20 meters in the late evening and early hours of the morning. During daytime, all the upper HF bands may offer opportunities with even the possibility of a 10 meter opening from around 1000 to 1500 UTC. The op- Optimum band with a 90% probability of an opening is 15 meters during late morning. And now the VHF and up propagation news. The hoped for tropo didn't materialize last week and the charts look very unsettled again. Later in the week, one of the weather models predicts a small high in the cold air over northern Britain, but others are less convinced and maintain a much larger high near the Azores. Any useful ridging from this extending into the continent to give some tropo across the Mediterranean, France and Iberia is sadly just out of reach from the UK. The moon reaches minimum declination on Friday, so we will have short moon windows and low elevations with losses still quite high. We are still in the early year minimum of random meteor rates, so persistence and early morning activity is still the order of the day for meteor scatter operators. Overall then, it's not looking promising for any significant tropo, but perhaps other modes will come to our rescue, like rain scatter on the gigahertz bands, or possibly aurora. This is perhaps a good week to try some satellite QSOs if you want to keep your VHF and up QSO rates ticking over. And that's all this week from the Propagation Team. The story behind JJ Radio coming up in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. From the studios of the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, with this RAIN report. One of the major challenges blind hams face is finding an HF radio that can be operated effectively without sighted assistance. One blind ham who has taken it upon himself to change that is Jim Schaefer, KE5AL of Pflugerville, Texas. Rains Hapali KC9RP recently spoke with Jim about his accessible software. I don't know how young I was when I started going to what we called code practice. This was at the Iowa School for the Blind. Lloyd Rasmussen, W3IUU, taught code practice. When a couple of friends came to me and asked me if I wanted to go to code practice, my first question was, do you have to put your gym clothes on for that? But we went down to the radio room, and it was a lot of fun. They had all this really neat radio equipment. There was a Collins KWM2 down there, and uh, Lloyd would send code, and we'd try to copy it. I was probably nine or so when we first started. We had a lot of fun. I was first licensed in February of 65. I was 11 years old. What was your first call? WN0LKM. How is it that you got into software? When I went to college, I was interested in physics, and I, I took physics and math. In fact, that's I have a double major in physics and math. We had a, a digital equipment corporation's PDP-8 in the physics department. That was a real computer app that had switches and dials and lights on it, and you had to toggle in a bootstrap routine from the switch register and then load up a paper tape to get it going. How did you manage to do anything with that, not being able to see all the flashing lights? I could see a little bit, and I could see enough to read if I got real close to it. What came off the teletype, I wasn't very fast, but I... uh, 
kept at it. When I got out of college, I got a job with the state of Iowa in data processing and worked there for three years. And then I got a job with IBM in Rochester, Minnesota. Two years later, they moved me to Austin, Texas in 1980. And I've been here ever since. What I really did mostly was I worked on online applications for the driver's license department, the query motor vehicle registration that the cops use and the driver's license query that they use. And I did a lot of basic assembler language on the the IBM 370s. So I kind of got started into a low-level programming fairly early. And when I went to IBM, I worked on a compiler for a while and eventually ended up working on the AIX operating system, the uh, serviceability tools in the kernel. At what point did you start to think in terms of wanting to make radios more accessible to the blind? I had a TS-930 back in the 80s, and I was able to read the front panel of it. I could read the frequency readout, and I could kind of tell what the meter was doing. I couldn't really read it very well, but I could peek it, and I could tell pretty much what the S meter reading was. Then I got another TS-930 about 2005. My vision had degraded to the point I couldn't read the dial. This one had the PIEXX computer control board that works with a TS-930. I was able to control it using a terminal program. In fact, I used TerraTerm, and I ended up writing some JAWS scripts for TerraTerm and allowed me to uh, use the TS-930. Then when I retired, I started playing around with Visual Studio on the PC here, wrote a standalone program to control my 930 that has become uh, JJ Radio. Do you sell any of your modified software? No, it's original software. I didn't modify somebody else's, and I give it away. I figure we have enough expenses in this hobby without having to spend money on software. I'm retired, and I just do this as part of the hobby. After you developed the accessible software for the TS-930, what was next? Well, I got a TS-590. I decided I wanted a really modern radio. For the time, I think I got it in 2012 or 13, so I guess it, it had been out a while, but... The 590, you can really computer control it. And and of course, one of the nice things about it is you can also use it with speech. So I kind of was able to use the 590's uh, speech to bootstrap the project, verify that I really was reading the frequency right. I have the cat commands for the 590 and the 2000. And then a friend let me borrow his LCraft K3 for uh, a few months, and I got my software working with that. Most of the radios these days can be computer controlled. What is the most difficult aspect of making this software so accessible? Making software accessible is not difficult as long as you start with accessibility from day one. Somebody who's used to using a mouse would probably find it kind of boring. What you've got is just a straight control panel. Text boxes and combo boxes and things that work very well for for blind people, but it's not very sexy. We need functionality. The accessibility isn't difficult as long as you make it a goal from the beginning. You're listening to a conversation between blind software developer Jim Schaefer, KE5AL, and Hap Holly KC9RP. It would seem the only drawback to your software is not what you do with the software, it's how much the darn radios cost. Yeah, that's probably true, and that's another reason that blind hams don't need to have to pay for a bunch of software on top of that just so they can use their radios. They've already, especially if you're using JAWS, you already had to pay something for that, or somebody did. You've got your computer and you've got your radio expense. I just provide an enabler and let you use the radio. So tell me the radios that are now accessible with your software. JJ Radio supports the Kenwood TS-2000 and the 590, and it will work with other Kenwood rigs too. In fact, to some extent, it'll work with about any rig that's using the CAT commands because some of those are pretty standard at least. So to some extent, it'll work with, with a lot of radios. But it pretty much fully supports the uh, the 590. For example, you can read the menus. I have text descriptions of all the menus and parameters. And the same is true with the 2000. The LCraft, it supports the menus and memories. For example, allows you to name your memories. At least in the 2000 and 590, it does. It makes those rigs really very usable. I have a uh, Kenwood TS-480. I can get the computer cable, the software from Kenwood that's available. Will your software do more for me than that manufactured, provided, and developed? 
software? Probably not for the 480. For the 590, I would say yes, it will. I wouldn't make that claim for the 480 because the Kenwood provided software will let you save and restore settings and mine won't. The Kenwood program for the 480 supports the 480 better than JJ Radio does. But I would say for the 590, I would certainly use JJ Radio, mainly because it makes working with the menus and memories pretty easy. Is that because it's newer technology? No, it's because I s supported those radios specifically. I mean, the menus, for example, I had to put in all the text for the menus. If I own a Kenwood TS 590 and the optional speech in the radio... Why really use JJ Radio? Yeah. The thing I really like about JJ Radio is, see, I use it with a refreshable Braille display. In fact, when I'm using my radio, I turn the computer speech off. I don't even use a computer speech because it gets in the way of using the radio. I'm trying to listen to the radio and the computer at the same time, and I'm not, I'm not a very good multitasker. I really prefer to use Braille. I have a 40-cell uh, Braille display. It's a PacMate display, actually. If you have the speech unit for the 590, for example, you go into the menus, and it'll tell you that you're on menu 6, but it won't tell you that menu 6 is whatever menu 6 is. I can read the SWR on the 590 and the 2000. As a matter of fact, on the Flex Radio app, it really works nice with the pan adapter. If someone would like more information about JJ Radio, where do they go? Well, they can go to my website, www.jjshafer.net, and that's J-J-S-H-A-F-F-E-R.net. You can download the program from there, and you can uh, download uh, the manual before you download the program. And I really recommend that you do read the manual. I have a getting started section in there that you can start with, but you really ought to read the whole manual. You don't want to miss out on something. The email address, please. The email is jjs, as in JJ Schaefer, at jjschaefer.net. jjs at jjschaefer.net. You can also email me at ke5al at arrl.org. ke5al at arrl.org. And that concludes our brief look at JJ Radio. Software developed by a blind Pflugerville, Texas ham, Jim Schaefer, KE5AL. The Rain Report is copyright 1990-2016 Rain. All rights reserved. Now on behalf of all those snowbound Rain affiliates on the East Coast, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, bidding you very 73 from the Radio Amateur Information Network www.therainreport.com at The Rain Report on Twitter and via iTunes.